Litecoin is, pri uh, is cheap and fast, therefore it is the future. Monero is private and has scalable box size, therefore it is the future. Some other coin has quantum resistance, therefore it's the future. Let me introduce uh, economist, long-time Bitcoiner and trader, Tone Ways, who will explain to you why all these claims are bullshit. Uh, so, enjoy. Thank you for that. Wow, no pressure at all. Hey, everyone. Wow, full room, this is excellent. Uh, Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, thank you, uh, Hackers Congress, for inviting me back. Uh, I believe this is my third uh, straight year uh, here speaking. Uh, how many of you were here last year and watched me present right here on the same stage? Um, all right. Oh, not that many people. I should have brought the same presentation back. This is a brand new one. Uh, so we have to change it up. Uh, those that were here last year would have uh, uh, seen my presentation on... Uh, called Bitcoin Value Proposition, uh, where I talked about the history of Bitcoin and why it's economically uh, useful and why the world will most likely adopt it. In this presentation, we're going to take a slightly different turn and we're going to talk about why uh, Bitcoin will be the only cryptocurrency left standing uh, when it's all said and done. I'm not going to spend too much time talking about myself. Everyone knows how to use Google, uh, so you can go ahead and just throw my name in there. I have a uh, I have a YouTube channel where I do daily videos. Lately, they've just mostly been about price analysis. Uh, just been traveling too much. Other than that, there's law shows. Uh, there used to be news shows. I'll try to bring those back. The Crypto Scam series was very popular. I have a couple of conferences called Unconfiscatable, Understanding Bitcoin and the Financial Summit. I don't have that logo in this particular photo. So. Now, my other presentation on Bitcoin's value proposition ran a little long, and this was the last slide of that presentation that I never had time to get to. So I decided to build a presentation specifically around my very last slide in the presentation on Bitcoin's value proposition. And I wanted to just classify all of the stuff we have in the crypto space other than Bitcoin uh, into a Venn diagram, and I quickly realized that I have to use a four-circle Venn diagram. And now that many coins are starting to merge mine with Bitcoin because they can't survive on their own, uh, this may have to be a five-circle Venn diagram in the future because everybody keeps pivoting. But we're going to stick with the four Venn diagram for now. So how are we going to break down these altcoins? Uh, we have proof of work. We have ICOs and airdrops. We have proof of stake. I believe NEM is proof of importance. I use proof of other. You can use proof of trees, whatever you like. IBM was talking about proof of time, whatever the hell that means. But um, um, so this is proof of other. And then we have our databases. This is your blockchains, your decentralized ledgers, and anything that's really a database, but they call it a blockchain. Uh, so. Let's go back to the beginning. Almost every single one of my presentation begins with the same slide. Um, I'm sure, how many of you here have read the Satoshi White Paper? All right, the majority of the hands. Um, that, that's great. Now, you really almost didn't have to read the Satoshi White Paper unless you're technologically inclined. All you had to do was read the abstract of the Satoshi White Paper, and you really start to understand what the innovation is and what Satoshi accomplished. So I'm just going to read uh, two sentences from, uh, well, three sentences from the abstract of the white paper. Digital signatures provide part of the solution, but the main benefits are lost if a trusted third party is still required to prevent double spending. We propose a solution to the double spending problem using peer-to-peer -peer network. The network timestamps transactions by hashing them into an ongoing chain of hash-based proof of work, uh, forming a record that cannot be changed without redoing the proof of work. That is the innovation right there. That's what Satoshi solved. He solved double spending, and he solved it with proof of work. That's it. The word blockchain does not appear anywhere in the Satoshi white paper. Uh, the word blockchain was a note in the code. I think that's my next slide, actually. Um, 
Uh, that, uh, yep, that slide is going to come up next. Uh, and I just want to point out, um, you really want to read the references. Uh, the references in Stoshi White Paper is very important. Um, so four of them uh, refer to the work by, um, I, think, I think his first name is uh, Steve uh, Stornetta. I actually met him at a recent conference, had an interview with him, it was very interesting. And uh, Adam Back's work on Hashcash was also very, very critical. So what does that mean? Like, wh where does this word blockchain even come from? Well, it comes from here. It comes from a note, a comment in, uh, in the code that says when they solve proof of work, they broadcast the block to everyone and the block is added to the blockchain. Um, in Satoshi's original work, I don't have uh, screenshots of that, he referred to it as a time chain and then he changed the wording to blockchain. But that's not the innovation. The innovation is proof of work. So anytime you hear proof of stake solves the problem, proof of stake has existed even before computers. Uh, the concept is, not, is there. Whoever has the most gets to earn the most and gets to control the most. That's proof of stake. Uh, there's nothing innovative there. Proof of work was the actual innovation. So let's stick with proof of work. Why is that so important? And for that, uh, we're going to go and look at a footnote from the Bitcoin Standard, a book that I recommend everybody read. How many of you have read the Bitcoin Standard? Excellent. Now, put those hands down. How many of you should read the Bitcoin standard? Uh, <laughs> every other hand should go up. Excellent. Uh, all right. So here it is. Uh, a lot of uh, projects demonize mining. Mining is now like, what, the 80th country? Uh, mining takes up more electricity than uh, uh, only like, like 80 countries take up more electricity than mining. And eventually, it's going to be in the top 10. And eventually, it will probably be more than any single country. Uh, but Proof of work gets demonized for being bad for the environment. That could be a whole other presentation, but let's just talk about the economics of it. The question of whether Bitcoin wastes electricity is at its heart a misunderstanding of the fundamentally subjective nature of value. Electricity is generated worldwide in large quantities uh, to satisfy the needs of consumers. The only judgment about whether this electricity has gone to waste or not lies with the consumer who pays for it. People who are willing to pay the cost of the operation of the Bitcoin network for their transactions are effectively financing this electricity consumption, which means the electricity is being produced to satisfy consumer needs and has not been wasted. Functionally speaking, proof of work is the only method humans have invented for creating digital hard money. If people find that worth paying for, the electricity has not been wasted. Okay, so keep that in mind, that uh, of proof of work. Now, let's talk about how proof of work eventually came about. A lot of people think that Bitcoin just randomly got created by Satoshi and about six months later, someone uh, who is able to change three lines in Bitcoin's code says, I solved the problem, I did it better, uh, these are your Vitalik's and everybody else. Uh, so let's go back, uh, let's go back a while. Uh, let, let's, uh, this is an email exchange from 2001, uh, I'll, I'll mention who sent the exchange after. But let's read the end of this, uh, like the end of this email, and then I'll talk about who it's from. So here it is. Someone has written this in an email. Personally, I like the idea of Hashcash. This is going back to Adam Back's work. Personally, I like the idea of cash, Hashcash if and only if it's structured like a real currency as opposed to simply proof of work. In the real world, you pay for resources used. In many cases, this should also apply to peer-to-peer -peer and other computer systems. Of course, getting hash cash workable as a real currency is extremely difficult. I've thought of a scheme that would work. Coins are signed by owner and can only be changed, signed to a different owner by the owner. Except you need a decentralized central database of all the hash cash that's been minted. Unworkable. Shit, spend twice problem. The spend twice problem and attempting to solve it has been worked on for a long time. This is 2001, okay? And this was an email to Hal Finney and a couple of other people from the FreeNet project. Who wrote this email? That was Peter Todd, who may or may not be in this room, but he's in the building. 
Uh, and he wrote this when he was 15 uh, in a conversation with Hal Finney on a Saturday afternoon at 12 o'clock in the afternoon. So people have been trying to solve this problem for a really, really long time. Um, a lot smarter people than the ones that came around immediately after Bitcoin came out. So when you hear someone that says, I solved it, like I, I, I solved the problem, what, what's the one that's popular these days, um, hash graphs or whatever, like people are coming up with these things like yesterday. You got to realize that people have been working on this for 20 years. Very, very smart people. And Bitcoin is the end result of the best thinking that there was. Okay, uh, and that's another. So next time somebody releases some other cryptocurrency, ask them what they were doing when they were 15 years old on a Saturday. Okay, were they trying to solve proof of work? Okay, uh, uh, were they trying to create proof of work to solve double spend? I mean, okay. So um, what makes Bitcoin unique? What gives Bitcoin value? Well, the same thing that gives all currencies value, and that is confidence in that currency. Uh, people always talk about how the US dollar is going to get dethroned as the world reserve currency. Oh really? Which country is going to be the next world reserve currency? Uh, who are you going to trust? Uh, I keep hearing Russia has all this gold. Uh, Russia is going to back their currency by gold and they're going to work together with China. Unless you can send an airplane full of rubles to Russia and expect Putin to send you a smaller airplane full of gold back, uh, no one's going to trust the Russian currency as the world reserve currency. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, the reason why the U.S. dollar is the world reserve currency is because the world trusts the transparency of the U.S. government, uh, and the the and that's the money you want to hold in your pocket anywhere in the world over any other fiat currency. Uh, so this is where Bitcoin also gets its value. The immutability is not a feature of the Bitcoin software, which is trivial to change for anyone with coding skills, but rather is grounded in the economics of the currency and network and stems from the difficulty of getting every member of the network to adopt the same change to the software. Again, I'm quoting from the Bitcoin standard. Uh, right here's a quote from Satoshi himself in six months after Bitcoin was released. The nature of Bitcoin is such that once version 0.1 was released, the core design was set in stone for the rest of its lifetime. The fact that Bitcoin can't be easily changed is what gives the world and the people confidence that there will be 21 million Bitcoins, that your transactions will go through, that there will not be anyone in the middle of those transactions. And for me, the most important part, and I'm kind of wearing it on my shirt, is the fact that Bitcoin is the only asset humans have ever owned that is unconfiscatable. Anything else you have ever owned in your life could be confiscated from you by someone with a bigger gun, uh, except Bitcoin. Okay, That's the one thing you can keep that's valuable. And uh, the events of uh, Cyprus and Greece, uh, if you guys remember, uh, you're not too far here in Europe, uh, will not happen to your money um, if it's in Bitcoin. So, sticking with the book, uh, talking about hard money. So now uh, we're about to get into the concept of why is it going to be Bitcoin and not other cryptocurrencies. Uh, so, quick quotes on hard money. Hard money, uh, by taking the question of supply out of the hands of governments and their economists, uh, would force everyone to be productive to society instead of seeking to get rich through the fool's errand of monetary manipulation. International economic summits are convened where world leaders try to negotiate each other's acceptable currency devaluation, making the value of the currency an issue of geopolitical importance. For every other money, as its value rises, those who can produce it will start to produce more of it, whether it's rye stones, seashells, silver, gold, copper, or government money. Everyone will have an incentive to try to produce more. Bitcoin is the hardest money ever invented. Growth in its value cannot possibly increase its supply. It can only make the network more secure and immune to attack. And it makes Bitcoin fundamentally different from every other money. So that's the background. Now let's talk about specific cryptocurrencies in the space. Uh, now they can pretend 
that they're not competing with Bitcoin, but in the reality, they, that's what they want to do. That's the only reason why you would go ahead and invent it. So uh, let's talk about the most popular one, and that is Litecoin. Uh, the badges that you guys are wearing, you can go ahead and spend Litecoin. So why is uh, Litecoin, uh, I'm going to make the case that Litecoin will not succeed and why Litecoin will go to zero. Uh, so here's a quote from Charlie Lee. Uh, Litecoin is the silver to Bitcoin's gold. It must be true since it's written in the Bitcoin blockchain. Okay, so once again, the Bitcoin blockchain is referenced, uh, even in quoting how it's gold. Um, and then uh, there's a statement uh, right below. Uh, someone replied, to uh, Charlie Lee. If it's true, then Bitcoin is uh, the gold to Monero's platinum, and we'll get to Monero in a minute. So here's a little more detail from Charlie Lee on uh, I know Litecoin being silver to Bitcoin's gold. Uh, Bitcoin is gold, Litecoin is silver, and XRP are diamonds. Uh, that was a quote from Charlie Lee. I was actually really curious on the XRP are diamonds part. Uh, I don't know if anyone here has seen my crypto scam with Peter Todd about Ripple. Uh, so as everyone knows, I, I'm not a fan. Um, I just sent out a recent tweet about Ripple, and it had like 450 comments. And um, I think over 400 of them were by Ripple people. And I speak at like 40 conferences a year. I'm probably, between meetups and public events and events, I'm probably at close to 50 events a year. Never once had I seen an actual person of the Ripple army wearing a Ripple t-shirt, wearing a Ripple hat. Like, they're all bots. They're all fake. They're probably getting paid because Ripple is just printing money. Anyway, a little side tangent. So I was curious on the diamonds part. So uh, Charlie, uh, Charlie Lee elaborates. Uh, the extreme centralization of XRP uh, makes him share specific characteristics with the diamond market. Uh, first of all, centralization allows for some manipulation. Uh, Charlie also commented that holding Ripple uh, is, uh, is good news for fiat lovers. So uh, I was curious on Ripple chart versus the price of diamonds, and it's actually very, very similar. So, <laughs> so right here, the blue is the price of diamonds. That went unreasonably high in 1980. And uh, there's your price of diamonds today. And uh, of course, it is fully controlled and completely manipulated. Uh, and that's very easy to tell because diamonds do not have futures contracts. I am not able to participate in the price discovery of diamonds, but I am able to participate in the price discovery of oil, uh, gold, silver, it doesn't matter. Uh, and there's your chart of Ripple uh, right there next to it. Uh, there, uh, it's a little old now, it's from back in July. Uh, the year is almost over. I should probably update. I do expect this to keep going down uh, because Ripple is totally centralized and completely useless. So, so here's my case for why Litecoin is not much different. And I'm going to quote once again from the Bitcoin standard. By the 19th century, however, with the development of modern banking and the improvement in methods of communication, individuals could transact with paper money and checks backed by gold in the treasuries of their banks and central banks. This made gold-backed transactions possible at any scale, thus obviating the need for silver's monetary role and gathering all essential monetary saleability properties in the gold standard. And that is a very, very critical statement that a lot of people haven't really considered. Um, a lot of silver promoters, you know, the gold bugs that also think that silver can go to $5,000 an ounce. Um, they're basing this on like multi-thousand year history that silver was more money, more common money than gold. And that made sense because a thousand years ago, even a gram of gold would buy you too much stuff. So if you wanted to buy your cup of coffee, you had to use silver. Um, it was the micropayment to gold. But all that changed with the advent of electricity and modern banking, and in today's world, the internet. So once you're able to use gold at any scale, there's no longer a monetary need for silver. And this is why recently we saw the silver to gold ratio hit 100, where geologically it's 17 to 1 or so. And uh, a lot of people are saying, well, if there is 17 times more, uh, if gold is 17 times more rare than silver, they should be priced at 17 to 1. But 
Gold's value is mostly speculation on its monetary property, which is also for silver, but less so every single decade. And people will realize that. So you don't need a micropayment if your actual better, harder money can scale. So as Bitcoin scales with Lightning, uh, Litecoin will no longer be needed as that micropayment. And uh, this was actually pointed out by Luke Dash Jr., uh, who explained it very, very well. Uh, and this was back in 2013, where he stated, well, actually, I'm going to read this part too. Um, Bitcoin, by nature, can only provide the same value put into it. So in its raw state, it functions as nothing more than a pump and dump scam, as it simply redistributes money from the buyer to the seller. The reason why Bitcoin itself escapes this category is that it is a major technological innovation bringing something new, trustless currency that has value to the world. By being adopted as a currency, Bitcoin can benefit even those who buy into it last. So he makes the point that because Bitcoin is an actual innovation, that's what prevents it from being a pump and dump um, scam like tulips, because tulips were not an innovation. Um, he goes on to say, Litecoin and other scam coins like it, on the other hand, do not bring anything new to the table. They are just mere clones that retain the pump and dump nature of Bitcoin, but without the innovation that makes Bitcoin viable as a currency. Litecoin specifically made three irrelevant changes. They changed the proof of work function from SHA to script, and then he explains how that's not any better. Um, faster target block time, this is often passed off as faster confirmation, but in reality it isn't at all. To get the same security as six Bitcoin blocks, Litecoin would need 24 blocks, and I believe that's even more now because they have a lot less uh, mining hash rate. And finally, larger currency supply. Uh, we all know that one Bitcoin is divisible to eight decimal places, so there's more micro Bitcoin than Litecoin, so no silver to gold. Uh, so all of this has been debunked, you know, six years ago now, that you're not going to need a micro payment. So that's uh, one of the biggest problems with Litecoin. I don't have, uh, I don't have this in the slides, but I'll add the fact that, um, so. Bitcoin's hash rate continues to grow. More and more people will continue to mine it. Um, and for Bitcoin, because the hash rate is growing so fast, Bitcoin will probably need to more than double in price every four years. Just think about it, right? Bitcoin do way, does way better than doubling in price every four years, though we're only 10 years in. We have to give it more time. But in reality, as long as Bitcoin only goes up, doubles in price every four years, the current level of mining will continue to make the same amount of money. Um, and Bitcoin can continue doing this for like another 100 years. All it has to do is just double in price every four years. And our current uh, hash rate and security stays the same, and it's so much higher than any other currency. Uh, for something like Litecoin, if it doesn't double in a four-year stretch, if it doesn't double by the next halving, who would mine it? And that's a big problem. So every single proof of work coin besides Bitcoin is at risk of like a mining death spiral, like no one would mine it. Also, who would invest in research and development to create new mining technology um, for other coins if they don't trust the fact that they're going to be around? Uh, so uh, these other proof of work coins have a major problem with, uh, with their mining structure, which is why they're either gonna all switch to proof of stake you're seeing Ethereum trying to do that already, uh, but they always said that from the beginning. Uh, so you're gonna see all of these coins, uh, they have three choices. They will either drastically increase uh, the number of coins they, to reward the miners, they can switch to proof of stake, or what's been happening already, you're gonna start merge mining with Bitcoin, uh, because otherwise your mining will simply fail. Uh, so let's talk about Monero. See a Monero sign right there. I'm not exactly sure what that is, but I'll find out. Um, so the privacy side. Well, you need to use Monero because it's more private than Bitcoin. Well, sure, uh, Monero does have privacy at its base level, but it's debatable whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, it makes Monero a lot more complicated uh, to work with, and it also 
uh, creates potential inflation bugs that you may uh, not know exist. That's, uh, that's the same problem that people uh, speculate on Zcash. And here are all of the privacy uh, improvements to Bitcoin that are either already implemented or going to be implemented. Schnorr signatures, taproot bulletproofs, uh, uh, Musig, CoinJoin, uh, PayJoin, Join Markets, Mast, Graphroot, Confidential Transactions, Wasabi Wallet and Samurai Wallets, they're already mixing transactions, Lightning over Thor, uh, the liquid sidechain. So a lot of people use Monero. Well, if you have Bitcoin and you want to um, de-anonymize your Bitcoin, just move it into Monero and then move it back into Bitcoin. But now you're using some kind of a centralized exchange. So you're not really being that private, but moving your Bitcoin into liquid Bitcoin and then moving them back out without taking on any currency risk or any exchange risk uh, so does the same, uh, gives you the same kind of anonymity. Uh, and as far as your transaction anonymity, that's coming. And uh, maybe it will never be as good as Monero, but it will certainly be good enough for 99.9% .9 of the people using it. So here's a little slide I put together of how all of these altcoins, and we like to call them shitcoins, come about. Well, ever since Bitcoin, and I have to uh, give credit to my friend Giacomo Zucco on this one, we were just chatting, or he might have mentioned it in one of his presentations, and he didn't even probably realize uh, how critical that statement was. But Satoshi was able to create Bitcoin, and he knew it was going to be money. And after that happened, people suddenly saw a way to monetize a line of code. So it goes something like this. Oh my God, I just coded the greatest privacy encryption protocol of all time. And you can reply to that. But is it backwards compatible with Bitcoin? Can it be implemented as a soft fork? And here are your choices. If the answer is yes, and it's a great improvement to Bitcoin, and it could be backwards compatible, it will be implemented. If it's not, has anyone tried to monetize it yet? Yes, it's a shitcoin. And no, then it's going to be a future shitcoin because it will never get the critical mass of Bitcoin. What makes Bitcoin valuable is the fact that its first two years of existence is not replicatable. Miners were mining it at a loss. It was worthless. Developers were coding it because they wanted to. It was worthless. This is why you have thousands of Bitcoin in landfills on old hard drives. You cannot monetize a piece of code today, promote it, and everyone that buys into it from day one is expecting to get rich on it. That's not how it works. That's not how decentralization works, okay? So ever since Bitcoin, every time someone comes up with a line of code that they think is innovative, where in the past it would simply be an interesting piece of code to be implemented for encryption, today I'm going to make a currency out of it and get rich. And uh, those projects will always fail. All right, let's take a look at a few more of these. I got about five more minutes. Uh, so let's take a look at Zcash. Well, what's the problem with Zcash? Well, they are a centrally controlled company. So, um, so here is Zcash. When building Zcash, the Zcash company chose to take a slightly different approach, um, allocating a portion of uh, issued Zcash to early investors and founders uh, distributed over the first four years of the project. Historically, they have been very transparent, sure. 80% of issued Zcash uh, goes to the miners, 3% goes to the foundation, 2.8% uh, is going to the Zcash company that controls everything, and the remaining 14% is basically uh, given out to employees, the creator himself, and the four years is almost up, and they're about to go broke, so how are they going to pay their developers? This is why they want to take more money from the miners. These are all simply for-profit companies. They have absolutely nothing to do with a distributed currency. Zuko Wilcox pushes for new developer fund uh, to support Zcash. So basically you have a person that just simply wants to make money by writing code the rest of his life that is totally useless and people will continue to pay for that. So he wants to basically pay himself another, I don't know, 
I don't know what he pays himself, 200,000 a month, 100,000 a month, whatever it is. He just wants to keep paying that forever in order to just program Zcash for as long as possible, even though no one in their right mind is ever going to use it. Uh, we can talk about uh, Dash as well. Uh, Dash started out as Xcoin, then they rebranded to Darkcoin, then they rebranded to Dash Pay, and they're probably going to rebrand again because of all the scammy nature in the beginning of it. Basically, you create a bunch of currency uh, in the first hour of its existence, and then you claim that it was by accident, but it's a good thing because now we have money to you know, pay our developers. Uh, you also lie about how many coins you're going to have, and then a day later you divide that by four so that the amount of currency you create for yourself is no longer 5% uh, but is now 20%. Uh, so there's lots of, lots of, lots of scammy things that went on uh, from announcing that it was going to be a for-profit project from the, uh, before the launch uh, to uh, clearly doing it on purpose at the launch and printing a bunch of money for yourself. Uh, let's move over. I used to do these graphics. I got about a few more minutes. Uh, so let's move over to Steemit, uh, another amazing concept of I will just create my own money and I will pay you in my own money to post on my website. And we will have the most centralized uh, website like Reddit known to man where 20 or 30 people decide what is displayed on the front page of our website of your content all under the disguise of it is a decentralized blockchain of some form. Uh, so this was my uh, knowledge chart. And I used to, I, it was great. I had the DAO right here. I had the DAO. I, I tweeted this out with the DAO right before Mount Stupid. And that was like a week before the DAO imploded. Uh, so that was perfect timing. I think people are starting to realize by now that Steemit is basically a bunch of guys printing their own money, trying to convince you uh, to put your content there, they will pay you in their own money, and then somebody is buying that from you, and you're basically diluting other people with monopoly money. Uh, let's go over to Veritasium, another one of these ICOs that is currently in a lot of trouble with the SEC. Um, I did an interview with Reggie Middleton um, as he was launching this, and I questioned pretty much everything that he's now in trouble for. Um, tried to warn him, but didn't work. Uh, so this is what happens when you do an ICO, though, now what happened with EOS, just a little slap on the wrist, and uh, they can go on and continue with their security. Rootstock was another one, a uh, popular blockchain that was going to do smart contracts on top of Bitcoin. Unfortunately for Rootstock, uh, the liquid sidechain uh, will do everything they were going to do, but better and simpler because it's literally a Bitcoin sidechain without uh, an extra currency. And this is, so if anyone is not familiar with the liquid sidechain, uh, you definitely want to look into it. You can put your ICOs, if you like, right on top of that instead of using Ethereum. Um, and finally, my last slide, I don't really have time to get into all of them. Uh, I don't have a problem with our three or Hyperledger because they don't have any tokens. Uh, they're just databases. Uh, Ripple, I have a giant problem with. We didn't get to Ethereum, but I have three episodes of Crypto Scam on Ethereum. Just Google Crypto Scam on my YouTube channel and you will find those. Um, we can talk about Ethereum all day. Uh, great tweet by Giacomo Zucco. Bitcoin maximalism, also known as moderate common sense, where Bitcoin could succeed, uh, maybe could succeed, uh, is in the middle of the spectrum. The other two extremes are you have uh, Bitcoin cannot exist at all. That's your no-coiner like Noriel Rubini or the multi-coiner extreme where Bitcoin is infinitely replicatable and my clone is the best. This is your Vitalik Buterin or anyone else that has ever created an altcoin. Um, I think I'm good. Um, I have some time for questions. Uh, if an Ethereum question comes up, uh, you know what, I'll just mention it real quick. Uh, to me, Ethereum has four critical problems, though one of them, uh, because of the EOS, uh, because of the SEC not caring about EOS's existence, the first problem of Ethereum is actually going to go away. Uh, but it, to, from the beginning, from day one, I said that Ethereum is an unlicensed, unregistered security in multiple violations of financial laws. Uh, and I expected the SEC and other regulators to do something about it because they could, because it's centralized, but they didn't. And now, probably not going to do it at all. But I always felt that, you, uh, that Ethereum was a regulation risk. 
Uh, if they declare it a security, it's basically screwed, and you can't trade it on all these decentralized exchanges. Uh, its second problem is, of course, technological. Ethereum just can't scale. Uh, if you don't believe me, try to download an Ethereum full node. Good luck. Um, and uh, the number of nodes will just go down and down and down. Um, the other problem is, of course, economic in that you're not, you don't need to, you shouldn't accept the stock of your project as the currency of your project. So if you ever used Amazon, imagine if the currency on Amazon was Amazon stock that fluctuates every minute of every day. That makes no sense at all. If you want to execute your smart contract, you should be able to pay in whatever currency you like. It should be independent things. So it has a huge economic problem uh, because smart contracts on liquid sidechain will, will be uh, at least denominated in Bitcoin, which they need. Um, and the final problem with Ethereum um, um, is conceptual. Uh, decentralization is very, very costly. This is why Bitcoin mining is so expensive and so energy intensive. Decentralization needs to be worth it. Uh, and smart contracts, a soda machine is a smart contract. Put, a, put your euro in, get your soda out. That's a smart contract. Why does that need to be decentralized? It's using up an unreasonable amount of resources for something that's not necessary. And if you just work up the chain, there's almost nothing that requires decentralization to prevent censorship in a smart contract. Because at the end of the day, in a smart contract, something or someone has to do something in the physical world. And if it can be done in the physical world, it cannot be decentralized. It doesn't work that way. All right, guys, that's the presentation. I have time for questions. Uh, thank you so much, and uh, thank you for coming and attending. Thank you, Tom. Any question? Okay, here. Hey, so have you ever thought about the philosophical aspect of uh, shit coins? So, like, I mean, if you think about it, every shit coin is basically just the product of the inherent human greed. Because, you know, Bitcoin is completely unique as how it has started. And everything else is just created out of, of human needs for more and more money. Because, you know, if you take a look at, for example, Zuko, he's just funding his own work. Oh, well, yeah, that's what I said. Yeah, if yeah. you look at uh, Charlie Lee, he's also doing it to make more money and to make a living because he wants to live a good life. Zuko said that he, he doesn't have to worry anymore about going into the shopping mall and then buying expensive goods. You get what I'm saying? Well, yeah, no, no, but that's pretty much what I said as well. Now, I will give Charlie Lee a little bit of slack. I mean, back when he created Litecoin, it was like the concept of creating Bitcoin alternatives was actually like new and interesting at the time, the fact that you could. By the time Zuko came around, it was obvious that this was an out outright scam. Uh, but back when Charlie Lee was doing it, uh, that was, it, it was better at that time. Uh, so I don't really, uh, I'm not mad at Charlie Lee for doing it back then. Uh, anybody could have done that. Ripple is different. They just created a billion, 100 billion tokens from the start. There was no mining. There was nothing. Uh, but yeah, but that's exactly what's happening. And eventually people will, you know, stop. They're not going to buy into this nonsense, right? Just the way that no one is buying up uh, dot coms because it's a dot com. Like now people are like, well, what company is it? What do they do? When back in, uh, in the 90s, you know, you slap a dot .com on it and all of a sudden you have a profitable company. And today we all have a website. It doesn't mean that uh, someone is going to invest money in your website. So eventually the same thing is going to happen here. No one is going to invest in these things unless there is actually clients and customers in a profitable business and creating your own currency is not a profitable business. It's profitable for you. It's not profitable for anybody else. No. Hi there. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, first of all, I'd like to suggest a correction to the beginning of your presentation because you claimed they were fixing the PAO proof of work problem, which they weren't at all. PAO already existed. They were fixing the Byzantine general consensus. Well, I see, yeah, I meant they were fixing the double spending problem with exactly. proof of work. That's what I. Which yeah. you claimed that blockchain was not instrumental for that. And it was because you needed a decentralized ledger where everyone could agree. For, for that problem to be fixed. So it was not Paul, it was not pro proof of work which was fixed. It was the 
Byzantine consensus. Right, right. But the word blockchain, like everyone has their own definition of blockchain. My definition of blockchain is proof of work. Okay. It's yours. I'll, 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 I'll take it as it is. Regarding s some other stuff of your presentation, I deeply disagree with several things that you mentioned. First of all, your suggesting for privacy, you're suggesting to, uh, for everyone to use a solution that, first of all, is not trustless, and you're presenting as trustless and as a great improvement over centralized solutions like marketplaces, and Liquid is not a decentralized solution. Um, so that's, that's, that, I think, should concern well, wait, 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 wait. most but, of the... But, but my view of Liquid was moving your Bitcoin into Liquid and then moving it back out into Bitcoin which is a lot more trustless than moving your Bitcoin through a centralized exchange into Monero and moving it back into Bitcoin through the centralized exchange. You, you don't need necessarily to move it into Bitcoin at any point. Uh, since that you have also a great confidence on the future of Bitcoin um, privacy, I, I would like to ask you if you're willing, and I know that you're uh, an older, and I, I do appreciate your, your show, I watch it a lot. I know that you're older. I would like to ask you if you're willing to change your Bitcoin for the most tainted coins that anyone in this room has. Would you be willing to do that with the confidence on the privacy future techniques that you claim Bitcoin will have? Um, I actually would, as long as it's not publicly known that I did it. Okay. So. I wouldn't do it on camera, and as long as I know that that person won't take a like, as long as that transaction is not like public by someone else in the room, okay. I would not mind. Okay, and just just a final question. Sorry, um, you talk you you mentioned a 15 year old kid on the on the beginning of your presentation, and also that taps into the artist money that you mentioned that Bitcoin is and the security proposition of that Bitcoin has. Uh, that 15-year-old kid that you cited in the beginning has several doubts that the uh, security model of Bitcoin as is with the current uh, emission rate will sustain the security after 2140. Um, yeah, so uh, I can comment on that. Also, just on the tainted Bitcoin thing, um, in addition to that uh, statement, I would have to not know in advance, like if someone told me that, hey, this is tainted, then I wouldn't do the transaction because, again, I don't know that person. But if the Bitcoin is coming in, I don't know where it's coming from. But if someone tells me that this Bitcoin was used in an illicit transaction, I would then not take it uh, because then I know that, that it's actually tainted. The point is that you're not supposed to know. The bigger problem uh, with using something like Monero is that it will not have a store of value. So it's okay to use it in transactions if you need the privacy. But if no one is willing to hold it for a longer period of time, it kind of becomes like a hot potato. Uh, this is what the Bcash people haven't figured out and um, basically why their currency continues to drop because that currency is for spending and not for saving. So for example, I think the currency right now in the world that is most use, used for transactions is probably the Venezuelan Boulevard. Because the moment you acquire the Venezuelan Boulevard, you are trying to spend it as soon as possible. Because if you don't spend it immediately, it will do nothing but lose value. Okay? And this is the problem with uh, something like Monero, is that if you hold on to it for any length of time, it's going to lose value. So the moment you acquire it, you need to immediately spend it. Uh, and, that's the, and, and that's one of the problems because it, just, it will not uh, be something uh, to store uh, your wealth in. Uh, and, uh, and I'll admit, Monero is more private than Bitcoin, but Bitcoin's privacy will be more than sufficient uh, for, uh, and it will be fungible. Uh, it just needs a little more time because things are an instant. Uh, to talk about mining incentives in the year 2140. Uh, I mean, I'm not gonna be alive. I have no idea. Uh, I'm trying to be, still be alive in 2140, but the odds are not with me. And uh, um, so what's gonna happen then? That's a common question. What happens to Bitcoin when uh, mining reward is 
um, is no more. And there's a couple of things here. So first of all, like I said earlier, as long as Bitcoin doubles in price every four years, that's not an issue. Then uh, people will still mine at today's hash rate. The hash rate just probably won't increase. Um, I believe that Bitcoin can do better than doubling in price every four years. Now, my um, transaction fees uh, should be able to pick up the slack as more and more people start to use Bitcoin. Uh, so transaction fees uh, is the common way to answer the question as to what would be the mining incentive in the future. I have another answer. Um, I believe that even if the mining fees are not sufficient, people will still mine. People will mine at a loss. Uh, for example, do you earn money directly from paying for your internet? And the answer is no, right? The internet is not monetized the way Bitcoin is monetized. So why are you willing to lose money every year, every month on paying an internet bill? And the answer is because your life will really, really suck if you did not have internet. And, um, and for most people, you may not even have a job. Like the reason why people are investing in internet infrastructure still today, and the reason why you pay an internet bill is because the internet brings you more value than the bill that you pay. So what happens when you want to protect your savings? You want to protect your unconfiscatable savings. What happens when a business is earning a billion dollars a year because of Bitcoin's existence? How much money do you think they'll be willing to spend mining at a loss? I think it's easy, 200 million, 300 million. They get to keep the other 700 million just by Bitcoin's existence. I think there will be enough mining out there at a loss to protect the system uh, because the system helps you. Okay. I'm sorry we don't have more time for questions, but you can catch him after now. And thank you for coming. All right, thank you.